when children are refluxing, we may see them trying to hold down that refluxate as it's making its way up through the esophagus, almost like they're trying so hard, no, I have to keep this down, I have to keep this down, I don't want it coming in my mouth, that tastes awful, I don't want it. So all of those behaviors of trying to hold something down can lead to tightness in the oral cavity. It can also lead to tightness in the rib cage, shoulder girdle, and then up into the oral structures. And for those of you who took part one in this series, remember our discussions about, about postural stability and its impact on oral motor movements. If we have tightness in the rib cage, that can radiate upwards into the oral cavity. Okay, so how do we teach pill swallowing? I have actually done this quite a bit in the last couple years. And the most success that I have with that is with modifying activities for the child. So I'll have the child start out with either applesauce or water with a cut piece of a hard candy like an M&M or a Tic Tac or something like that so that she can get the feeling of having a piece of something in her mouth along with that food or liquid. Then I give the child cues to push the food back um, or push the liquid back, do a really hard swallow, do a fast swallow, tip the head back slightly, or swish that candy piece with the water in the mouth before the swallow happens. And a child can also think about applesauce or water just flowing down over her tongue like a river, and that's more of a visualization task, might be more appropriate for an older child. When the child is successful with swallowing that small bit of candy, then we would slowly increase the size of the candy that is supposed to be swallowed all the way up to an exact pill size. Okay, so this is Cameron. He um, is going to be drinking thin water with a straw in this video segment. And his positioning is really key. So what I'm actually getting him to do is to do a chin tuck with his drinking. It was noted on that most recent swallow study that keeping him at midline was a good thing for his airway protection. So we are always trying to keep him upright and then bring his head with a, a slight chin tuck um, because he tends to throw his head back. So if we can bring it forward, even if he would move his head, it would still be pretty up and down and not in a hyperextended position. So we'll go ahead and take a look at Cameron. All right, so what type of cueing was used to help Cameron bring his head into that chin tuck position? Well, because he is blind and he is also deaf, he cannot hear, I can't give him verbal cues. So most of the cues we give him are tactile. So by wiggling the straw and then when he started leaning in towards it, I kept pulling it further forward so he had to follow it. And I also brought it down and that's what brought his head down to a somewhat flexed position. And then he was able to do his drinking at that point. Okay, we talked about changing specific cups or straws or bottles. We can also change the cup and vessel position with how it is presented to the mouth. So sometimes we might want to look at bearing that and we might think to ourselves, what would be a more what would be more appropriate for a particular child? Would we want to place that cup anteriorly to the mouth at midline while directing the liquid into the mouth via a narrower channel? Or would it be more appropriate to place that cup deeper in the mouth where the rim of the cup is actually pressed into the corners of the mouth and that might provide a better lip seal? We discussed the difference in cup placement in uh, part one of the series when we talked about lip closure. So there is some overlap between the cup position whether we're looking at lip seal or if we're looking at how swallowing occurs. So you can see from my pictures below, in the first picture, I'm drinking with a pretty narrow channel of liquid where I'm using more lip seal and you can actually see how tight my lips are sealed on the glass. And then in the second picture, I'm pressing the glass deeper into my 
the corners of my mouth and you can see my lips are not as active and I'm definitely getting a wider channel of liquid which would probably increase the volume. Another thing we need to think about when we're discussing bottle or cup position is the angle of the tipping of the cup. Could how far we tip it actually lead to better or even worse swallowing? Are we allowing a child to actively suckle that liquid into his mouth or are we dumping that liquid maybe into the anterior sulci and then letting the child manage it from that point on its own? This is pretty important when we're talking about children who are def uh, dependent feeders. So we need to think about if we're having active drinking versus passive intake of liquids into the mouth. That is definitely going to impact how a child's going to respond with his swallow. Whether he is more under control of it or if we are providing maximum assistance to get that swallow going. So mom and dad were really not in a place to go there at this point to have a feeding tube place, but they did agree to meet with the gastroenterologist as a consult to get some information, but they really didn't want to go that route. So based on this last swallow study, I changed tactics and therapy. And we did even, we did some pretty intensive tongue exercises with him and I actually spent more time working on his respiratory support. So we worked on increasing expiratory flow, did some lot of, a lot of bubble and horn blowing with him. It was a little bit hard initially because of his VPI to teach him how to blow out of his mouth, um, but he was able to get there. We worked on improving his cough support and I completed, started doing rib cage handling with him. It really was looking to me like he had some decreased mobility there. Um, please refer back to part one on uh, rib cage handling information and why that would be done. So if a child with ASD does eat fruits and vegetables, which can happen, the ones that I see that these children will typically have are bananas, apples, and raw carrots, and that's about it. I also see that there is quite a bit of rigidity in the child's eating patterns. So for example, a child may eat chicken nuggets from one fast food restaurant, probably some of you are naming it in your heads right now, um, but then that child will not eat a chicken nugget from any other places. Or the child will eat different kinds of chicken nuggets, but not chicken strips because they look totally different. We are gonna discuss uh, rigid feeding patterns coming up in a few slides and there are lots of things to think about when we're talking about rigidity and eating. Many children who have received G-tube feedings for quite a long period of time have difficulty really getting um, oral eating established and it's not going to magically develop in a very short period of time. You can see the chart um, in the picture. That's a thick chart. That's a child that's been in therapy for quite some time. And I always described this situation, this part of therapy, as a figure skating scenario. So if someone asked me to go out onto the ice and do a figure skating program, there's no way in heck that I'd be able to do that. I would have to have some pretty specific training and I would need lots and lots of practice in order to even get close to doing anything like that. And we have to think about children who have feeding tubes going through the same experience. This is going to be a monumental task for these children to overcome, to figure out how to get all their nutrition and hydration by mouth. So we as therapists may have to teach the oral motor skills that really never developed with this population because maybe there were no oral experiences in order to practice tongue movements and chewing movements and lip closure. We have to work closely with the medical, uh, child's medical team in order to assist the child with learning what hunger is and, and what to do about it if the tube is not there or not being used. We want to give that child some time in order to figure out how do I get rid of this hunger feeling with my mouth. We have to assist a child with being in a better place with his mouth in terms of any hyper responsiveness with a gag reflex that we see. And as you can see with all of these areas that we need to address, it really is like climbing a mountain. So many of you will remember Aaliyah from part one. She's here again. 
And just a reminder, she is a 13 year old who is typically developing until about one and a half years of age, at which point she sustained a head injury. She was subsequently diagnosed with spastic CP. She has a history of G-tube feedings, and she had a video fluoroscopic swallow study in 2015, which revealed oropharyngeal dysphagia with poor oral control of solid foods and laryngeal penetration with thin liquids. And she has lots of global delays given her diagnosis of spastic CP. Okay, so let me give you a little bit more background information on Aaliyah before we look at the video. So Aaliyah can produce very quiet swallows, but then she can also have swallows with gulping sounds. And in this video segment that you're going to watch, I've cued her to actually do her old swallow because we're working on improved, well, I won't talk about it because we're going to talk about what we think is going on. We're working on some things to help improve that or to change that. So what I would encourage you to do is to turn up the volume on your computers right now pretty high. And um, I'm going to play this clip. It's really, really short, but I'm going to play it four times for you. What you're going to be listening for is right at the beginning of the clip. So let's listen to it the first time here. Okay, was that a loud one? Yeah. Kind of sounded like it, okay. Okay, here's number two. Okay, was that a loud one? Yeah. Kind of sounded like it, okay. Number three. Okay, was that a loud one? Yeah. Kind of sounded like it, okay. And one more time, number four. Okay, was that a loud one? Yeah. Kind of sounded like it, okay. Aaliyah's great because she has great understanding of what I'm asking her, so it was really awesome that she could do her old swallow for you guys so you could hear what she used to do in quite a bit of her swallowing. So what type of sound did you hear with Aaliyah Swallow with her saliva? I would describe it as being a little bit on the loud side. Um, and it sounded like gulping to me. And you might correlate it to when you have taken a really large drink of a liquid and you had to gulp it down to get it all down in one swallow. That's what it kind of sounds like to me. So what would we suspect could be occurring here? Well, with gulping, as I mentioned on an earlier slide, I'm thinking that she's having aerophagia, which probably is leading me to think she has decreased tongue to palate contact. It could be impacted by a tongue thrust swallow. Now we did not see her tongue come out between her lips, but she does have a tongue thrust swallow pattern. So there could be some pressure of the tongue tip that is being placed on the back of the teeth um, when she does a tongue thrust swallow. So we're going to take a look at Aaliyah a little bit later on in the therapy section and we'll look at some of the strategies that I've used with her in order to prove her overall swallow sounds which hopefully is going to improve her swallow function.